Good evening, everybody. Uh, hi, Suresh. Hi. <laughs> um, it's my great pleasure and delight to introduce uh, Dr. Suresh Kumar to all of you. Uh, Suresh and I go back uh, 25 years. Uh, mm -hmm. We were both uh, students at the Wildlife Institute of India in Dehradun at the, at the same time. And uh, I have to say that uh, in, the, in the subsequent years, the things I wanted to do uh, has been something of great envy uh, for me. So very career studied so many different things in so many different places uh, that it's really remarkable. Today, Suresh is going to be talking about migration, particular bird migration. And he has studied a lot of birds, which I'll talk about in a minute. But actually, uh, he's studied a whole bunch of other things. He, um, he uh, did a study on Arunachal macaques in the Northeast. He, uh, his PhD, in fact, is on sea turtles and uh, not on birds. And he studied other kinds of turtles, other fauna as well. But today we're here uh, to listen to him speak about birds. And he um, started off uh, after his master's thesis by going to the Northeast, doing surveys for pheasants, uh, finding a new subspecies of a pheasant in the Northeast. Um, he's, uh, he, likes, he says he likes to uh, study uh, sort of lesser known species uh, that are threatened and that people don't know much about. And in the last uh, five to 10 years, uh, really, I think uh, Suresh has become the most uh, distinguished, the most prominent uh, biologist in India who uses satellite te telemetry to understand the movements of, uh, of species. And so he's uh, put uh, these satellite transmitters on a number of species, helping us to understand their global movements, most notably um, the Amur falcons. Uh, and he has done this uh, in uh, Nagaland and in Manipur. And these have uh, the data from these, uh, this work has shown us really the remarkable migration of, of this remarkable species. And I'm sure he'll, uh, he'll talk uh, more about it. Um, but also other species, and most recently, uh, he's been tracking the migration of pied cuckoos, these amazing birds that fly uh, between Africa and India, uh, from Africa following the monsoon or in advance of the monsoon to central and northern India. And their migration has really been a mystery so far. And I think we're on the cusp of understanding exactly you know, their migration routes and what they, you know, the winds they use and so on. And all that is thanks to work that Suresh has pioneered. So I think this is going to be a very exciting talk. Thank you, Suresh, for being with us. And over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Suhail. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure. Uh, when uh, Garima contacted me a few days ago and said uh, that uh, I need to do this on uh, on my uh, on the on migration, which is one of my favorite subjects, and it's about sharing stories. So which is why it's titled uh, Migration Stories and so it, it's, a, it's a great honor to be here today and uh, make a presentation on this aspect, which, is so, which was so dear to Dr. Salim Ali, and it is, it is on his birthday, on his birth anniversary. So, uh, uh, and I'm also extremely apologetic to all of the uh, uh, participants in this program for having patiently waited. I am sorry I couldn't keep up with my time. I got caught up with another meeting. But I'll try and make up for it by trying and uh, keeping you entertained with some uh, fascinating stories about uh, what we have uh, got to know about a few of these species. They're incredible. They're amazing. So uh, without much, uh, without wasting, wasting much time, I think I'd, I'd go ahead with my story. So I understand that uh, most of you who are here today uh, for this talk uh, are fascinated already by birds and uh, you may, some of you may not be able to identify a particular species, but sites like what I have shown here on this slide, is something that's very familiar to you. And it's not just birds flying from one place to another. You also seem to connect with them. You seem to feel that, oh, these birds seem to be coming from somewhere. I've not seen them before. Oh, well, where are they coming from? You know, so these are these curiosity things that uh, many of us experience. And so as a kid, as a young boy uh, in my early years, I used to have the same uh, feeling. And for me, literally today, if I see a, if I see an Amur falcon, I literally uh, get a, get goosebumps, you know, because I seem to connect with them. I seem to know where they have exactly come from. So there are some visuals that I have over the years, uh, you know, gathered. And so what the point here is that birds are incredible. They are, they're just amazing. And, uh, their, their capabilities, the things that they do is, uh, you know, no match. There's 
probably very few other uh, taxa groups that can uh, match up with them. So uh, straight uh, to the first question, I believe there is a, there is a set of polling questions. So uh, there's a lot of young audience. So I, uh, the, my first question, please, uh, uh, to Garima, I, I would like the first question, which is birds migrate only during the day. Is it true or is it false? It's false. So I think the audience, I, I now understand uh, the audience temperament. So I, I better keep my questions a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, detailed and technical. So you're right. Uh, the birds uh, don't necessarily fly during the day. They fly during uh, the night invariably more, but uh, all through the day they do fly. So that's right. So moving on to the, uh, uh, to the next part. Yeah. How do I close this? Okay, I have to shut this. Okay, I'm sorry, skip to. Okay, so uh, migratory birds, you know, literally crisscross every expanse of this amazing continent that we live on, uh, which is why we, we understand that they are one of the most successful group of uh, you know, living organisms on this planet. They are found in extreme uh, cold polar regions to oceanic, deep oceanic areas to really right at the top of the mountain. So they're, they're just there everywhere. And one of the reason for this is because of their ability to fly across uh, landscapes, across seascapes. And so it's simply because of their ability to fly. So if you look at the uh, the world total of migratory species, nearly 40% of the birds that we know are migratory in nature. And with uh, increasing knowledge, increasing information coming in through research, these numbers definitely to go up. So we are talking about something like 4,000 species around the world that are known to migrate. And they could move from any direction, from the North Hemisphere to the Southern Hemisphere, from the East to the West in, in any different forms. So incredible in what uh, they are capable of doing. And we will go more into the details. Uh, so uh, the next question for the audience is, which of the following is not a migratory bird? Let's see whether you get this right. So which of the following is not a migratory bird? You have rosy starling, red battle lapping, pin tail duck, and step eagle. Okay, okay. Okay, so which of the following is not a migratory bird? So I think uh, it's more like a trick question. Uh, I'm sorry about that. But uh, most of you have, uh, uh, I think, uh, got it right. Uh, nearly 50% of you have got it right by saying that the red battle lapping, in fact, that's the right answer. All the other three species are actually migratory. So uh, moving on. Uh, to the next uh, slide, and uh, it is about India, right? While we talk about 4,000 species that are migratory across the world, that represents about 40% of the world, world bird populations, we have equally 40% of the birds that we know in India are also migratory. So we have about 1,300 odd species, uh, and that around at least 300, 350 species are migratory. So we do have an incredible number of migrants, and a majority of these birds are coming in from the Northern Hemisphere, okay? So a majority of them. There is definitely a few which are coming from other places that you will get to hear from me uh, in the later part of the uh, presentation. So the next question here would be, for the audience, the next question, which of the following birds migrate to India to breed, okay? You have the pied cuckoo, red battle lapping, emerald dove, and the painted stock. Okay, now most birds that come to that migrate to India, they are migrating during the winter months. That is as we speak now, and they have finished breeding and they are going to spend their non-breeding period here in India. But there are a few that do come into India for for breeding. Okay. So I think here, again, we have about 50% of the people answering this poll correct. And it is the pied cuckoo, okay, which is a summer visitor to India. 
Thank you for that. So I'm learning quite a bit <laughs> along with all of you. Okay. So moving on to the uh, moving further. Okay, I thought uh, we should also discuss this when we talk about migratory birds. And uh, uh, so it is it is not just a few birds in in terms of their uh, large body size or something like that. This is an example of a of a small bird uh, which is known as the Blythe's reed warbler, which do migrate you know far uh, very far. And as you can see here, this is prepared by eBird India. And you can see here the all of the world's population of these Blythe's reed warbler descend down into India. So you can imagine the importance of this uh, relatively small area when you compare it with Asia or Africa or all of the other countries. So this is incredible, isn't it? So you have we have many such species migrating down. The all of their world population is there in India, whether it is for a short span of time or it's for the entire winter duration. So here again, I would pose a question: Which of the following? The next question, the poll question: Which of the following is the smallest migratory bird in the world? Okay. So remember, we are talking about a migratory bird and the smallest. Greenish warbler, alpine swift, gray wagtail, and uh, the Calliope hummingbird. Okay, so I think most of you got it right. I, 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 I'm, I understand that many of you do know hummingbirds very well, but we also know that the hummingbirds are really, really tiny, isn't it? So the point that I wanted to highlight here is that even such tiny birds, the hummingbird, this particular species, weighs about three grams, okay? Just three grams, three to 3.5 grams, and migrates uh, quite far distances in the North American continent from North America to South America. So incredible, isn't it? Okay, so thank you for the answer, and we learn some more. Okay, so now moving on. Okay, so with the... Uh, with some of those uh, interesting questions, now let's go and look at some of these other birds, uh, other migrants, which do some amazing stuff, okay? And here, there's a whole series of them. I don't want you to remember or try and read any of these names. Each of these birds are in their own right incredible, okay? In what they can do and what they can achieve. One of the uh, example that I can uh, that I will be talking about today is the Amur falcon that is listed here, and there is this Arctic tern that is also listed here. Arctic tern is one of those species that migrates from the North Pole to the South Pole, okay, covering more than probably about 70, 80,000 kilometers during its course of migration all the way from uh, Arctic to Antarctic. Okay, so this is again an incredible species. So it breeds in the Arctic region and winters in the Antarctic region. So why would they do that, isn't it? This is something that is quite exciting to know. Why should they do that? Why can't they just stay there in the Arctic and spend all the time? Why spend so much of energy traveling around? Is it someone like a traveler? You could, you could say that, okay? Uh, there is also this other bird that I've listed here, which is known as the Alpine Swift. This bird, Recent research shows that they spend uh, about several months up in being airborne. They never land. They eat, sleep, drink, everything up there in the air. So these are amazing in terms of their uh, you know, endurance. If you look at their capabilities or endurance, the ability to fly nonstop, to remain non uh, in the air for many, many days, these are amazing, okay? So I have listed here a few, a few, okay, I have missed one question. Uh, okay, I've missed one question. So let's move to the, okay. So in this particular slide, I've also highlighted one more of these incredible migrants. This is known as the Bartail Godwit, and it holds the record for the longest nonstop uh, uh, flying bird. It covers a distance of close to 13,000 kilometers in 11 days. Its breeding ground is high up there in Alaska in the Northern Hemisphere, and it goes down all the way to New Zealand to winter, okay? So on its way south, it just cuts across the Pacific Ocean. It cannot land anywhere in between, and it takes about 12 days. So 12 days of nonstop flight day and night. So you can imagine 
it doesn't sleep probably, or rather they, one part of the brain goes to rest while the other is active. On the return migration, as you see here, they will make several stops, northern parts of Australia and many other parts before returning back to Alaska. So it has two different migratory routes to get back uh, to Alaska or, you know, between Alaska and New Zealand. So why are they doing this? What is the strategy of doing this? Why can't they go back nonstop all the way back to Alaska? Okay, so I'll leave you with uh, wondering what that could be. And uh, I'll request uh, the next poll question coming here. Next question, please. Okay, uh, which bird holds the record of flying at the highest elevations during its migration? The greater flamingo, Indian skimmer, barn swallow. Okay, so uh, I think uh, you are all well aware about the bar-headed goose. This is very much an Indian species and is very famously known for simply crossing over the high Himalayan mountain ranges. So again, an in incredible species in terms of its ability to cross over the high Himalayan ranges where the oxygen levels are very, very low. And more importantly, the weather can be totally unpredictable. Anything could happen. And they have to do this crossing in just one go. They cannot land anywhere in between. If they do have to stop, then it, they're doomed. Okay. So moving on to the bar-headed goose uh, that I wanted to show you. This is the bar-headed goose. Some of you who are not familiar with the bird, it's a very, very beautiful goose, nice looking. And then this is what uh, tracking data, the research where people have put these instruments on them to see their flight path. And you can see how they have managed to go across and fly straight across the Tibetan plateau. This is the Tibetan region, very high elevation region, very difficult for many species to survive here. They would cross across and go straight across into Mongolia. Okay, so incredible in what they can do. So we've been uh, talking about what they, what they, what these some of these birds are doing, and still this question keeps lingering in my head. Why do they do this? I assume that this is the, this is also what you're all thinking about. Why do they do this? Okay, so let me ask you a question at this juncture. The next poll question. So many species of birds undertake migration. Okay, whether it is to escape harsh weather conditions, search of better feeding grounds, or to breed, or it's all of the above. Okay, so I think, uh, I think invariably everybody has got it right. 95% of you have got it right. It is all of the above. Okay. It is all interlinked to one another. Uh, so you have very harsh weather conditions that set in and that leads to lack of food. And as a result, these birds would need to move away from there and they wouldn't be breeding at that point of time. So it is all of the above. Okay. So to explain this better, let me show you this visual of what goes on with migratory birds. Okay, so you see a lot of these uh, colored arrow marks moving everywhere. Please concentrate up in the Northern Hemisphere. See up here, the, the snow is receding. It is getting warmer and warmer and all of the birds are moving up to breed. Okay, so there it is, there it is, there it is. They're going all the way close to the Arctic Circle. So a majority of the migrants are coming as far as the Arctic Circle. And then once they finish breeding, they come back. So why, why are they doing all this, right? So I will give you the reason for that with, this, with some of those examples that we will talk about later. But I would also like you to remember one thing here that we have this equator here. Many of these birds are not only crossing continents, but they are also flying across the equator. Okay, so this is a very, very important point to, to remember because one part of the year, these birds are there north of the equator. In the other time of the year, they go down to down south of the equator. 
So if you look at a lot of birds that are not migratory, a majority of them are all hanging around the equator. Okay, so uh, let me also ask you one more question before we move on to the stories of uh, what I have to share. Uh, which of the following cues are used by birds to navigate during migration? Sun and celestial compass, magnetic sensing, learned routes or landmarks, and all of the above. Okay, so I think uh, without doubt, we have a good number of uh, response for this. We have, we have about 80% of you uh, you know, stating that it is all of the above. And that's right, okay? So there are, there are a few birds which use landmarks, but invariably a lot of these birds do use the sun position, the star, star map, and they also seem to have a magnetic sense, okay? There is magnetic field from the pole to the pole and the equator. So this is a, they have a magnetic sense ingrained in their brains, a knowledge that uh, you know, they are, uh, their location is here and they have to orient themselves to reach their specific destinations. So you can imagine in next time when somebody calls you bird brain, you can actually cite the examples of what some of these migratory birds are capable of, okay? So bird brain is definitely intelligent brain, okay? So moving on to, now I have, I have completed a, a set of poll questions uh, now, moving on to the stories that I'm going to share with you all. Okay. Sorry. It's not moving. Okay. So, my story is going to be about three different birds and all that come to India on their migration. Okay. Uh, so, India, uh, amazing diversity in terms of birds. There's so many people watching birds. And... Uh, incredible diversity. If you compare with many other countries in the world, we are way, way ahead in terms of the numbers. But we are also way ahead in terms of hosting a lo lot of these species in very large numbers in, in India, in, within the Indian subcontinent. Okay, So a lot of birds uh, come from the north, like I have shown you here in the arrow. A few definitely cross the Himalayas, as you've already seen. A uh, majority, a lot of them do come from the western part of India, northwestern part of India, and very little is known about those birds that are coming in from the east. But uh, in recent years, we've, we've begun to understand that there is a good population of a lot of species that is moving into India through the eastern parts of India, northeastern parts of India. So together, this entire region, what you can see here in the slide, it composes the Central Asian Flyway. A lot of the birds that breed in the northern latitudes or close to the Arctic Circle, they may be breeding in areas where there is hardly any habitations, no threats at all to these birds, but they all will migrate down into one of the highly populated regions in the world, countries like India, Pakistan, Nepal, and also many parts of Southeast Asia and all. Okay. And you know the kind of development, the kind of um, land use, that is the changes in land use or habitat modifications that is happening. So all of these migratory birds are in some form or the other being impacted. So they are adapting to these changes. Some of these species may, I mean, are also on the decline, but uh, this is something that is in, that's very, very important to remember. I'm not going to talk to you more about that, but I'm going to give you some examples. So when, when, when I showed you about the paths that many of these birds are coming in, there are only a few birds that are able to cross over the Himalayas straight, okay? While many others try to avoid the Himalayas. As you all know, the Himalayas is the tallest mountain chain in the world and moves along the east-west axis. So it's literally a barrier, okay? Birds cannot cross that. Many birds cannot cross that. But the, Himal the presence of the Himalayas is also a boon to the birds. Just because of the Himalayas, it blocks out all the cold winds that are coming from the northern latitudes of countries like Russia and Mongolia, which is getting uh, cold now, or they have already cold now. And as a result of this Himalayan chain, the entire uh, peninsular part of India, the majority of India, remains tropical in climes. So I'm sitting in Dehradun right now. I'm feeling the winter chill. 
Okay, there are a lot of birds that are passing over here. They're not going to spend the winter here. They're going to move further down, all the way down to Bangalore, where Sohail and others are. So this is, so in a way, the Himalayas is a boon. So what I was trying to say here is that definitely a lot of birds avoid flying over. So they're coming in from the west as well as coming in from the east. Okay, so with that, we move on. Now, before I tell you a little bit more about the birds involved in the story, I would like you to further remember that the Himalayas have also acted as a very, very important uh, geographical feature, okay, a topographic feature, which has influenced the monsoon system. The Indian monsoon system is one of the, one of the very predominant monsoon systems in the world. And you can imagine in India, a major the economy is primarily agrarian or primarily people agriculture, agriculture based economy. So the monsoon is very, very important. So the Himalayas are responsible for it. Okay, how? Now the Southwest monsoon is the monsoon rain that majority of India we receive. And this rain actually builds up in the Indian Ocean, Southern Indian Ocean, somewhere far below African, below the African continent. And during the month of summer, okay, April, May, in the Northern Indian region, especially in the Gangetic Plain, it starts to get heated up. It heats up so much that the air is getting displaced over this region, okay? And as a result, the monsoon clouds and the monsoon winds, wind system, that is forming in the Southern Indian Ocean keeps getting sucked up. And that's how this monsoon moves and it hits the Kerala coast as you will see here in this image, it's coming in this direction. And then it will go into all over India, go into the Northeast and the Himalayas will block it. And then all along the Himalayan area, we will get rain. But the areas on the Northern side of the Himalayas, they don't get rain because it is in the rain shadow area, okay? Now, what happens to this monsoon? By September, this monsoon weakens completely and we will have a lull phase where there is no rain. But the same rain picks up as the Northeast monsoon and starts off from the Northeast. So it's called Northeast monsoon or the returning monsoon, goes back almost in the same direction where it originated and goes across India and then into Africa and then ultimately will go down to where it all started. So it's a beautiful cycle, okay? Now with this, where is the story of our birds here? Now birds are especially these long distance migrants, especially those that are crossing these oceanic uh, uh, you know, waters or you know, where there's Arabian Sea or the Bay of Bengal, if they are having to cross, they're really smart. They're waiting for these winds. They use these winds to fly across. These, are, these winds are known as jet streams, okay? and uh, they are very powerful. So these birds have to just hop onto that and they are just carried away. They glide away with those winds to wherever that they need to go. So these birds are very smart. And so the monsoon system is very, very important. So what happens when the monsoon is very poor in some years? Are these birds able to comfortably make it across? Or is it that in those years, many of them would perish while crossing the Arabian Sea? We may never know many of these answers, but all of this is possible. And definitely birds are all dependent on, on all of this. So the first of the story that I'm going to talk about, since we have spoken about the monsoon, I'm going to talk about the rain bird or the monsoon bird. Okay, and that's the pied cuckoo. The pied cuckoo is also interesting because it is a summer visitor. It comes to India during the summer. Unlike most of the other migrant birds, which are winter visitors that are coming now, so this bird had already come to India. So it had come to all the way down to Derado and it had, it had gone back uh, now. It has gone back from wherever it has started from, okay? So the pied cuckoo, uh, as rightly pointed out here by Rohan, uh, the cartoonist, uh, literally flies with the monsoon winds, okay? So very well captured here. So it brings the monsoon winds. So there is a lot written about this bird in our folklore. Okay, what the folklore says is that, especially the farmers, they wait to hear the call of this bird. The moment this bird arrives, it starts to call. Okay, so the farmers immediately start to till their fields, prepare their fields, because the monsoon would arrive very soon. 
Okay, so this is local knowledge, indigenous knowledge. There is a lot of citizen science initiative where information on whether is it is this in fact true has been gathered, and we now know that it is true. It is it is more or less true. But what we don't know still is it is it moving with the clouds? Is it moving with the rain? Is it moving? Is it coming with the rains? And is it going back with the receding monsoon rains? So, a project to understand this was envisaged. It was also envisaged to see how these monsoon systems, in some years it's weak, some years it's good, how these birds adapt, how are these birds able to uh, move across? The other reason is also that the, the pied cuckoo, there are three different subpopulations or what we call a subspecies, okay? So there are, there are three subspecies. There is one subspecies that is resident in Africa, one subspecies in southern part of India, okay? And the other subspecies, which is a migrant, which possibly is migrating between Africa and India. So if I'm sitting here in Dehradun and, I, and I'm looking at a pied cuckoo that has just arrived, then I assume that this particular cuckoo has actually come from Africa and it has actually come with the monsoon winds. This is our understanding. So this project is actually about understanding whether this is in fact true, okay? So we don't know the answer as yet, but uh, uh, just, uh, recently or early this year in July, we managed to put tracking units on two of these birds and one of them is on its way back. And it has left us wondering whether is it going to cross the sea, Arabian Sea or not. I'll show you that image. What is also really fascinating about the pied cuckoo is that it comes here during summer and it's a breeding visitor. It breeds here, okay? Now, this particular species is a brood parasite. It does not make its own nest. It goes and lays its eggs in other birds' nest. And its host is, a, is the very commonly seen jungle babbler, okay? The jungle babblers are again very interesting in the sense that they are cooperative breeders. They live in a small flock. Most likely all are related to one another. And they help raise the young of a pair, an adult pair that is maintaining the colony. So they're cooperative breeders. And the pied cuckoo is very smart to go and lay the eggs in the pied cuckoos in the jungle babbler's nest. So these are some of the images uh, that, we are, that were captured this year. So you can see one of the pied cuckoo that we have ringed, I mean, that we have tagged, that cuckoo's chick uh, very likely in a babbler's nest. And it was sitting with its, uh, uh, with the jungle babbler, not knowing that, uh, you know, that is not related to it at all. In a few days time, the cuckoo chick grows up and realizes that it is no longer a babbler and it's a cuckoo. So there is a lot of mysteries. There's a lot of, still a lot of stories about, you know, whether the pied cuckoos, the adults are watching over the babblers, whether the babblers, hey, are you guys taking care of our chick well? You know, things like that. So we've also made observations where the chick once it is fully fleshed and no longer dependent on the babblers for food and is able to fend for itself, goes and joins the adult pied cuckoo and then they seem to migrate together, okay? There are also other cuckoos where the adults will lay the eggs in the host's nest and go away. They go back on the migration and the chicks will be raised by the host and they will fledge and fend for themselves and leave on their migration the first time on their own. It could be all the way from Mongolia to Africa, and they do it. They are genetically programmed. They, they have that knowledge inbuilt into the brain. So really fascinating species. And I uh, wanted to share with you uh, about what uh, we have observed now. You can see this particular bird, we named it Chatak. Locally, uh, the, the local name for the pied cuckoo is Chatak. And uh, this particular Chatak was just tagged, captured and tagged uh, near the Wildlife Institute campus where, where, I, where I'm currently. And from there, it moved down to uh, southern, uh, the coastal areas of Maharashtra, and it is currently very close to Mang Mangalore. And I am of this opinion that it is probably waiting for the right wind conditions to make it across to the Arabian Sea. But we don't know. Are we dealing with a population of cuckoos that are coming to Dehradun, which are actually from southern India? We don't know. So let's wait and watch what, uh, what is the story. Uh, 
tracking some of these birds is also a challenge, just simply because they are very small in size. You cannot put any device on them. Uh, you know, if it is too big, too heavy, they, these birds would not be able to carry and move across. So the thumb rule when we take up this kind of research is that any instrument or tag that we put on a bird to track its movements or for just about anything, the weight of the tag has to be less than 3% uh, of their body weight. So as a result, this was quite challenging. It's only recently this particular company from the United States who started manufacturing these tags, which directly communicate to the satellite. Okay, this tag weighs just two grams and the cuckoo weighs about 65 to 70 grams. And this is just two grams. So absolutely no problem at all. And it's wearing it like a backpack and it doesn't even feel that it is having something on it. Okay, and uh, every day, the satellite which is passing over a particular region where the cuckoo is, it is going to pick up the signal and send that information to my laptop to tell you where the bird is. So as I talk to you now, one of the satellites is probably scanning the surface over Mangalore to pick up the location of uh, Chatak. Maybe the cuckoo is flying over the Arabian Sea as we speak, okay? So this is extremely fascinating, extremely interesting. And uh, so with that cuckoo story, we move on to two more fascinating stories of uh, two other birds. So I'm going to go to the West. So um, I would also like to share this excitement. I get excited when I talk about India, talk about diversity, talk about birds, simply because we are blessed with an amazing diversity, even in terms of landscape. If you're going from Gujarat and all the way to the Northeast, the culture changes, the food changes, the landscape changes. And so does the bird species that occur there changes. The migratory species that arrive in these areas change. So Gujarat, strictly vegetarian, people protect birds at all costs. It's part of their culture. But if you go to the Northeast, people are non-vegetarian and they do hunt animals. They do hunt and kill wild birds and you know they do hunt quite a lot of species. So amazing diversity in terms of culture. But let us talk about the story here. So I'm going to talk about the arid plains of uh, uh, Gujarat, okay, where I've been carrying out one of my study uh, on this particular bird known as the common crane. Common because it's one of the commonest of all the crane species that is known in the world. And it's also common because they are found in very large numbers, a good population. And if you look at the distribution range, this is the breeding range all over Europe and uh, Asia, Russia, and you can see in everywhere this, this particular common crane is found. But let, let me tell you this, that their breeding range may be very large, but it, when it comes to wintering, they are wintering in very small places. And increasingly what we have been observing is that these areas are shrinking more and more and more. So the populations are getting compacted. There's definitely some kind of decline in these populations, even though you still see them in good numbers. Okay, so this particular common cuckoo arrives in the parts of Rajasthan and Gujarat and some parts of the Deccan area also, historically even in the Deccan, but I don't think we see them that often in the Deccan anymore. So the, it's also an important point to state here that uh, the common uh, crane was the first satellite tagged bird from India. It was first attempted in 1995, 94, around that time. Uh, when they had again tagged birds from uh, Bharatpur, Gujarat, and uh, parts of Rajasthan. So it's one of the first. So nearly after a span of 25 years, we went and tagged the, uh, the common crane for the first time. And let me also tell you that the technology in tracking birds has also evolved greatly, immensely. So the kind of information that some of these instruments that we deploy on some of these birds is amazing. It, they, they literally tell you each and everything what the bird is doing or every location that they're going, the, we are able to discern. So that's very important, extremely important to know if your wintering grounds are well protected and if your breeding grounds are very well protected. But during the migration, they may be passing through areas where there is a lot of hunting. So if you do want to focus on how to control all of this hunting, then you need to know even those intervening habitats where they stop. So why Kutch? Why Gujarat? 
Why do these birds, why do these large bodied birds like cranes come and uh, occur in, or, or in such large numbers occur in Gujarat? So as I speak, a lot of cranes have arrived there. Now, simply because these landscapes, you know, flat open country for large birds like this, ground dwelling birds like this, visibility is very important for them. They need to keep a check for predators. They cannot be inside wooded areas. And also, there will be thermals that pick up. And so if they need to fly, they need to uh, you know, make, take benefit from these thermals to rise up in the air. That's one or two of these uh, possible reasons. But it almost mimics their breeding habitat, which is up there in the northern latitude. So that's one of the reasons why they're here. There is also this other reason that what they're looking for, food, which is diet, it is also governed by the diet or the food items that they're looking for where it is available, okay? So they might go and forage everywhere, forage in the agricultural fields, open flat landscapes. Much of these areas generally is regarded as wasteland, but and, you know it is definitely not a wasteland. It's such a unique ecosystem that needs to be protected. So all of these cranes would assemble every evening in a few small water bodies. And these cranes arriving back to roost, it's a, it's a spectacle to watch. The, when they do arrive, they are very vocal. And the call, you know, it's literally the entire place is vibrating or reverberating with the call of, so it's an experience to be felt with. So I definitely recommend many of you to go over there. Unfortunately, many of these birds are also faced with the threat of power lines and they collide with these power lines and do die. So it's, it's, there are lots of challenges about uh, protection of uh, cranes in this area, okay? So like I told you, as part of one of our projects, we tagged uh, the first of our cranes and you can see here, we have put a transmitter on it. And this is again, a very smart uh, unit in the sense that you can see these black areas that is actually a solar panel, which keeps charging. And this tag is put on the leg like a clamp and it's absolutely uh, perfectly fine with the crane. So where did this particular crane go? Okay, and there it is. Okay, so the crane start, sorry. So the crane started off on its migration on the 10th of April after spending a month here in Gujarat and then reached there by end of April. So in about 12 days, it reached Northern Kazakhstan. Okay, this particular landscape is known as the steppe landscape very similar in terms of rolling grasslands or hills and very typical of what you see here, but this is almost like in a more colder climb. And uh, it returned back uh, from there on the 20, it started off from there on the 29th September and arrived exactly to the same place where we captured and tagged and on the world migratory bird day, okay? So it was, it was amazing. What is amazing is also that they seem to show very high sight fidelity. All through their routes, they seem to know where all to stop. And the cranes only flew during the daytime. By night, they would reach a particular area, even while flying through some of these uh, desert areas. Uh, there are very large desert areas, that uh, hot desert areas that uh, they pass through, cold desert areas that they pass through. And there, there are these areas which appears like oasis. So the cranes have the knowledge of going and stopping there and then the next day starting off early in the morning and moving on. So at this point of time, I would like to ask this question again. Why would the crane not move even further than uh, Northern Kazakhstan? Of course, there would be some more populations breeding above, but why don't they go all the way till the Arctic? Or why don't they go uh, further like the Pied Cuckoo going into Africa, why don't they go down as far as uh, South Southern Africa? Okay, so there's a, those are very interesting questions. This is the habitat in Northern Kazakhstan where this particular bird was also breeding and roosting, a lot of wetlands, but unfortunately, even many of these areas are under uh, mechanized farming, intensive farming practices. So the cranes are in some way or the other being impacted or there are a lot of changes that is taking place. So moving on from the Western part of Gujarat, uh, Western uh, part of India, Gujarat to the Northeast. I had pointed to you earlier that uh, we're gonna talk about a species from the Northeast. And 
I guess a lot of you are already well aware about the Amur falcons. The Amur falcon have been, uh, have been literally like a celebrity bird over the last couple of years. A lot of people have come to watch this bird. And uh, also that uh, these are incredible. I keep saying every bird is incredible. So yet again here, there is another bird that's extremely incredible. Now, what is also very incredible is that uh, this bird breeds in the uh, northeastern part of uh, Asia, you know, like uh, the uh, uh, northern parts of China, Mongolia, and Russia. There is a river there, uh, a prominent, very important river there in that particular region here, right here, which is actually forms the divide between China and Russia that is known as the Amur River. And this bird gets its name from that particular river. And also your Amur tiger, many of you would be familiar, the Amur tiger is also from that particular landscape. It's also because of that particular river. So it breeds in this area and moves down uh, towards Southern China and then enters into India and then goes down all the way into Africa. So unlike the Pied Cuckoo, which is a summer visitor, the common crane, a winter visitor, your Amur falcon is a passage migrant. So naturally, why should it not stop here? Why, why doesn't this bird not stop here? Why does it go all the way down to Africa? Why is it spending so much energy, isn't it? So, uh, well, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's the way they are. So I'm going to tell you why they do that, okay? So we had started a project on uh, tracking the migration of the Amur falcons as part of a conservation initiative primarily to make people aware about how unique these birds are. And moreover, we also needed to know uh, where, uh, where else are they roosting in the northeastern part of India where there was hunting. There was a lot of hunting in, at a certain point of time. And we wanted to know where else are they, uh, are they uh, being hunted, which are their roost sites, and what are their migratory routes? Are they roosting elsewhere in India? Okay, so uh, without Speaking much about the Amur falcons, the, today we know Nagaland is the falcon capital of the world. Each and every speck that you see here is an Amur falcon. And there are many other uh, sites now in the Northeast, in Manipur state, as well as in Meghalaya, where you see similar such congregations. So it is just not one. And so we are talking about an incredible number of uh, birds. So as part of the conservation initiative, we captured and tagged, uh, uh, we have captured and tagged quite a few of the Amors. And the first of the birds was tagged in November, 2013 on the 7th of November. And uh, soon after release, so that was the first time we did this tagging. We didn't know what the bird was going to do. Soon after release, after a few days, that was on the 10th of November, it set out on its southbound migration. It started to fly over Bangladesh, and then we notice it's flying over the Bay of Bengal, a thousand kilometers over the ocean there, and then cuts across into Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, Maharashtra, and then where south of Pune, it's flying straight across into the Arabian Sea. Now, this distance was about 5,600 kilometers, starting from Nagaland to the next stop, which was in Somalia. So they made a nonstop flight of close to 5,600 kilometers in five days and 10 hours. So naturally, why would you would think, why would this bird do that? Why could it not just fly across straight like this over land and make these smaller uh, ocean crossings? Why should it be making this kind of a crossing, isn't it? So definitely these birds are smart. They're quite aware of uh, what, what is going on. And let me share with you that story. So this is the story of a majority of our birds that we have tagged. What is evident from here is that they are making, they are not only flying across the continent, they're crossing the equator. And like in many other birds, they are also making an elliptical migration, which is when they're going down, they go down in this direction, but on the way back, they come up towards the north and then return back to their breeding grounds. And what we also noticed is that they show amazing nesting site fidelity. It almost makes me feel that they go back to the same tree to nest. Now, when I talk about nest, there is a very, very interesting story again here that I would like to share, which is these birds don't make their own nest. They are not brood parasites. They will definitely lay their own eggs and take care of it, but they don't make their own nest. They actually lay their use the nest, abandoned nest of crows. 
Okay, there is one particular species that is known as a rook, jackdaw, and a few others. They, they use the abandoned nest. So which means you're talking about a million Amur falcons that you see in, in the Northeast, even 50% of them are going back to breed. There are that many number of nests that is available for the Amurs to nest on. This is the information that we have. So it's incredible, it's amazing. So coming back to the story <clears throat> as to why are they making these uh, you know, uh, uh, migratory journeys going down in one direction and returning back in another direction? So you need to recollect that when we started off this talk uh, or midway during my talk, I raised this uh, views about how our monsoons come into India. So this is a bird again playing around with the monsoon winds. Okay, so let me share with you uh, this. Okay, I would uh, I would also like to tell you here that in the breeding area they almost reach 40 to 50 degree north latitude. And in the non-breeding area, they're in at around 30 to 20 degree north latitude. But this is almost where the African continent ends. If this African continent would have extended even another 20 degrees further south, I'm sure the Amurs would have headed even there. Okay, so that's, that's not the case. So that's definitely one of the limiting factors that there is no land beyond. Okay, so now coming back to this question, and this is the last and final time that I'm going to be asking this question, why do they do this? Why does the Amur do this? Okay, so this is the monsoon connection. Okay, now if you go back and look at, this is the tracks of one particular bird, which I have used in invariably in many presentations of mine on the Amurs. What you also see is that the tracks are almost congruent with one another, almost overlapping with one another across years. So we were very, very uh, lucky to track a few of these individuals over many years, the same bird returning back to India and then going down to Africa. And so we can tell with confidence that these birds seem to know their route, their path. And every time that it did this, it was heading in this direction. So <clears throat> what you will see here, the time when these birds uh, are going down south, is when the Northeast monsoon is, is beginning and it is heading towards the uh, Arabian Sea. And in the Arabian Sea, it actually picks up more steam. It intensifies further and actually enters into Africa. And this is the rain that brings monsoon into Africa. And this rain clouds move down from Somalia all the way down to Kenya, Tanzania, and all of those beautiful uh, national parks and uh, sanctuaries there in Africa, Serengeti and all of these places, all the way down to South Africa. So the Amors are literally following the Northeast monsoon. So when they do arrive here in the North, in, in Nagaland, they're here to rest, no doubt. But the monsoon also has a very important connect. The monsoon actually, the post monsoon and the uh, northeast monsoon, that lull period, triggers off emergence of termites. And the Amurs are primarily insectivores. They feed extensively on insects. They could feed on birds and a few other things elsewhere. Here, opportunistically, they could feed, but here in the northeast, they're feeding on insects. And what we know is that they feed on termites. So you all know that rainfall triggers termite emergence. And that's exactly what is going on in Nagaland and Manipur and many parts of Northeast India at this point of time. Swarms and swarms of termites emerging influenced by this rainfall or this humidity and uh, precipitation that's going on. And so the Amurs are gorging on themselves, fattening up and getting ready for this nonstop flight. Nowhere else in India, you would see such emergence of termites. So clearly these Amurs are foraging on uh, uh, I mean, uh, fattening up and then making this crossing, assisted by these tailwinds. If they are flying at 45 kilometers per hour speed, that's the speed at which they're covering this distance, their effort is only 20 kilometers per hour because the tailwind is about 20 kilometers. Okay? So is the case in the, uh, on their northbound migration. On the northbound, what you see is that they're much earlier. They're crossing in mid-April. The southwest monsoon is about a month and a half or more away. So, but there are different kinds of winds at this point of time. This is the hot westerly winds that come from uh, the Arabian Peninsula, and these birds are taking advantage of that. Not that they're flying in, uh, in hot air, but they're pro probably flying at a certain height where it is cool, and they're making their journey back across India 
and on the return migration they don't stop in nagaland simply or northeast for that matter because there is no termite activity there is nothing to eat for them okay so while we thought this is the norm this is what the amurs do and invariably many of the amurs that we tagged we did that but one particular bird did something very different okay the first year when i was tracking it it returned back to uh, gujarat coast and i was predicting that it is going to go up towards uh, madhya pradesh and then uttar pradesh it turned down towards mumbai flew down to southern india going down to kolar and uh, a few other parts of the uh, drier parts of uh, uh, southern india and then headed back towards the northeast and went back to its breeding ground fine that's it's okay but what was really interesting is that every time this particular bird long leg we i call her the naga queen every time she will come down to southern india there is a cyclonic storm building up off the coast of sri lanka or andamans and this cyclonic storm is headed towards either andhra pradesh or odisha and one such was cyclone fanny last year uh, uh, i mean 2019 uh, in the month of may and that's exactly the time when long leg was arriving and she almost headed into the eye of the storm but she stopped in uh, in odisha she stopped for a night waited for the cyclone to make the landfall soon after the cyclone made the landfall the intensity of the cyclonic winds came down it immediately hopped on to the tail winds of the cyclone and the next i see it's just being uh, zoomed off straight to the northeast and head back so what is amazing here is that these birds are able to judge they are able to predict the weather much ahead seem to know they seem to see if sense pressure differences across you know kilometers you know across landscapes to know that there's going to be a cyclone there and i'm going to take benefit of these winds so incredible in what the knowledge that these birds have so this is one of the breeding sites of uh, the amur up there in uh, northern china and mongolia again unfortunately here again much of these areas are coming under intensive agriculture and i don't know how this is impacting these birds okay so if you look at the cranes and if you look at the amurs they are almost in the same latitude they use this landscape known as the steppe okay the cranes move to the western steppe whereas the amurs move to the eastern steppe this particular region known as manchuria and the reason that they go to these places is that during the breeding season or during the time when they are there it is summer the day length is very long it's 15 to 16 hours day length as compared to india which would be 10 10 hours to 10 to 12 hours so because of the increase in day length the higher temperature more food available they are maximizing on this this is the reason why many of these birds migrate to the northern latitude if you go even further up the day length is even more longer close to the arctic circle northern summer it's 24 hours daylight all through two or three months so high productivity lot of food but the same areas the resources are fluctuating so the same areas as the season changes becomes completely cold the day length is very short there's hardly any light it's cold no food available and so these birds are pushed to the lower areas but smart birds like the amurs go down across the equator because when it is summer in the northern latitudes or close to the arctic it is winter in the southern hemisphere or close to antarctica in those latitudes so the amur when it is summer it goes up there and when it is getting winter and when summer is arriving in southern area it will move down to the south so this bird never sees winter it always sees summer so this is also one of the reasons why this bird is able to occur in such large numbers okay so there are such fascinating stories of many more birds many other birds that are you know having such fascinating st stories to tell us so finally ecological barriers body size and flight behavior how how often they can how long they can fly and the diet these are all other factors that get factored in as to what birds can fly uh, you know across the equator or how far it would go and 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 all of that so with that i'll end my talk i think i have exceeded my time quite a bit 
I am sorry about that. Uh, thank you very much for patiently listening. And if there are any questions, you can still I can still take it. And uh, I'm sure you will remember this presentation when you see uh, flocks of birds uh, in flying either in the evening or in the morning. You would try and imagine a common crane or an amur falcon or a pied cuckoo. When the monsoon arrives next in India, you will remember the story about Chatak and the other uh, pied cuckoos that are on their annual journey back to India and uh, parasitize the poor jungle babblers, make them raise their young. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Suresh, for joining us today and sharing such fascinating insights on migration. Uh, if anyone in the audience has any questions for Dr. Suresh, please uh, type them in the chat box. Uh, we already have a few questions. Uh, I'll read them out to you. Yes, please. So um, the first question is that, um, do migratory birds ever get left behind? Uh, well, I cannot, uh, yeah, I, I have uh, seen quite a few examples of that. It's to do with the Amurs also. Uh, uh, quite a few times, it's invariably young birds or sick birds that get left behind. Also, there are several cases when uh, uh, birds do make mistakes. It's not that everyone is right all the time, but there is always course correction, especially when they are trying to navigate through some jet streams which uh, you know they did not predict very well uh, the intensity of those winds. So though they do get drifted away, they do get carried away. They end up in places where they generally do not occur. And if they're fit enough, they may make it back, but very often they do get stranded and uh, do ultimately die. And a lot of young birds uh, do die. Uh, you know, they get left behind. They get, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, Reshma is asking, um, as we go higher, the oxygen levels reduce. So how do birds fly with uh, low oxygen levels? Yes, so yes, yeah. so definitely the oxygen levels are, are going to be one of the major limiting factor in dictating what species could be able to. And like I told you, the example of the bar-headed geese, they have uh, adapted uh, to make these uh, crossing at these high elevations because they have a higher hemoglobin content. They can take in, store more oxygen in their blood when they are doing this crossing. There are other strategies also, okay? Uh, they try and make these crossing just like a mountaineer who is going to summit, okay? So you visualize a mountaineer who's on his last leg of climbing uh, the peak of Mount Everest, so they will invariably start at very early in the morning, at two o'clock in the morning or one o'clock in the morning with torchlights, and they will start scaling and go uh, at the first uh, light, they will be there at the top and they would descend down. So this is also the time of the day when the weather is very cool. And so when you are actually beating your wings and moving up, there is a lot of heat that is generated, but because of the cool conditions, your uh, energy expenditure is not much and you're able to navigate. So there are many other things uh, to this. Okay. Another question is, um, do the birds try to peck off the trackers that you put on them? Yeah, well, they can. They can and uh, they do peck. When, uh, when you initially put on, it's almost like when you get your ears pierced, even subconsciously you're moving your fingers on your ear, trying to say, hey, what's this? You know, what's the stuff that's there in my ear or nose or what, whatsoever. So the cranes do feel that or the amours do feel that, but over time they, go out of, they grow out of it. And uh, these uh, tags are manufactured, they're robust enough to withstand any kind of uh, such uh, damage being caused by Picking. Okay, and do these trackers um, interfere with the bird's magnetic sense? Well, no, uh, uh, definitely not. Okay, uh, so they, they work on a completely uh, different uh, principle. Uh, it, it has not been documented. Such thing has not documented. If that, were, if that would be the case, 
then you would not be able to uh, uh, successfully use this technology till date. And uh, you wouldn't be able to track your birds uh, you know, properly because they would be getting disoriented all the time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we have a few um, comments from people saying that uh, uh, they loved the presentation and uh, the presentation was wonderful. And Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Srinidhi is asking, does geopolitics play a role in our ability to track birds using a satellite? We say, uh, we, we say, we see images of Kazakhstan. Do some countries not allow satellite images of their lands to be taken? Uh, <laughs> that's a sensitive question, isn't yeah. it? Yes, uh, you are right. Uh, so there are there are locations which are uh, sensitive in nature, which is already morphed. Okay, like if I would like to zoom in and see as to where exactly my bird is, there is only a certain depth or a certain height at which I can zoom in. I can't zoom in really to the to the to the closest. Okay, so these satellites that give you this information do not have that kind of data to stream in that closely. Those data that you're talking about or that you probably are envisaging are all military satellites or spy satellites uh, that uh, have those uh, ability, those camera sensing abilities to zoom in really, really far. There are areas where you know some of the Amurs have gone and I've tried to zoom in in Northern China where I have tried to zoom in but after a certain point of time, I will see only a pixel. I won't be able to see any landmark, nothing, because it doesn't allow you to go beyond that. It's morphed. Okay. Uh, we have another question about uh, related to adaptations uh, that birds have when they fly, which enables them to fly higher. Uh, how, do, how do birds survive in extreme cold while flying over Himalayas? Uh, see, uh, first of all, they're flying over these areas for a duration of time. And they're also flying there only at a time when the weather is favorable, okay? So it is not that birds are going to be crossing the Himalayas in the peak winter, okay? When naturally the temperature is going to be extremely cold. So they're doing it in autumn or they're doing it in spring. So this is the transition phase. So where the weather is generally pleasant, that's how these birds have all evolved. So I don't think, I mean, of course, I agree with you that uh, 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 there could be extremes of temperatures, there could be erratic weather conditions and, and all of that. But I think they, are, uh, they have evolved enough or adapted enough to face those challenges. And many of the birds, especially geese, a lot, almost all birds have down feathers which protect them uh, very, very well insulate them very, very well. Okay. Um, Sagarika is asking, um, she has uh, seen huge flocks of egrets and ibises fly by during certain months, mostly pre-monsoon. Is it just local dispersion? Okay. So, uh, the, uh, see, I, 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 I feel, I don't know that the area that she's talking about, but many of these birds, they gather together, congregate together to roost, to go to sleep in a specific area, okay? So what she could have seen is one such gathering of these birds, either going to their roost, to their site to roost, or leaving their roost, heading out to the foraging ground. So in the daytime, they could disperse all across forage in across a much larger landscape, but as evening starts to set in, they all gather together, come together and return back as a flock or as multiple flocks to the roost. The other possibility is that because she said pre-monsoon, they could be breeding in that area uh, during that time. So they would be going out together to forage and then come back to the nesting site together. These are possibilities. Okay. Um, Samresh is asking, uh, Dr. Suresh spoke of one particular Amur falcon taking a different course during 
uh, funny. The return uh, migration, yes. Yeah, the, during the return migration. Uh, did the other Amur falcons do the same? Okay, so, uh, so we are talking about, you know, millions of Amurs, you know, thousands, hundred thousand Amurs, you can imagine from that photograph. So there is definitely uh, some populations moving down south, okay? Uh, as far south as southern India, and you know, going even further south, maybe into Kerala also. So uh, it is it, it is just one of the birds that we had tagged that had come down south. There was one another bird that uh, did this uh, early this year that was tagged in Manipur, but it didn't come to southern India, but it was rather skirting, you know, the Andhra Pradesh and then moving up, uh, Andhra Pradesh state and moving up from Gujarat. Usually what I used to expect is that from Gujarat, they will all will head towards, uh, uh, you know, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh and, uh, and Uttar Pradesh, but not go down or not go down straight across into uh, uh, central India, uh, which is, uh, you know, your northern parts of Maharashtra and Madhya Pradesh, that part. Of, but we seem to see. So there is, there is a lot of possibilities. And I, I strongly believe there are populations that have familiarity of the southern Indian landscape. In fact, the area where the, that particular bird long length came down, if you are close to Bangalore, if you're familiar with that landscape, there are protected areas known as uh, BRT Hills, Biligiri Ranga Hills, and uh, Satyamangalam Tiger Reserve, Mudumalai Tiger Reserve. If you go down to those landscape, you see the forest. It's generally thorn forest, okay? It's, a, it's like uh, deciduous and dry, dry vegetation. This, exactly depicts what the forests that you see in Kenya. So the Amur seem to connect all of these landscapes. They seem to know these areas and then uh, go up. So there is some familiarity. Okay, um, I'm going to take uh, one last question. I'm sorry uh, to, to those whose questions I haven't been able to address, but since we're running out of time, uh, Doctor, this is the last question for you. Uh, are there any changes in migratory patterns uh, due to global warming? Okay, so uh, that is a very difficult question to answer at this point of time. I mean, like from what we understand of our birds here in India, but there is a lot of uh, research elsewhere in other parts of the world where they have started to document that uh, there are quite a lot of changes that they have started to witness, either in the timing of arrival or departure. But, uh, you know, when, when you talk about uh, these impacts, especially global warming and uh, stuff like that, the, there are also these variations that we see that is possibly related to these climatic uh, events. You know, there are these erratic climatic events that you, that you see which is like short term. Uh, maybe all of these climatic events will finally lead to global warming or, you know, I don't say that uh, global warming is not happening. I'm not saying that. But what I'm seeing is that much of, the, there is still a lot more uh, work to be done with regard to this, to conclusively say, yes, okay. There is a lot of evidence, but how is it impacting these populations? That, that we, we are not in a position to say at this point. There are, okay, I can give you one example. Like there are years when the birds are able to raise more young. Like for example, there's, there are colleagues of mine in Hungary who are working on a sister species of the Amur, which is known as the red-footed falcon. If they're related. And it's known as the red-footed falcon, which also migrates down to Africa and goes up to Hungary and other parts of the European areas to breed. What they have found is in years when there is very good rainfall, and that particular year, there is good amount of rodents that's available in their landscape, and they're able to produce a lot of young. But same in, in some other years when it is complete drought situation, and so they, they fail. They don't raise that many young or the hatching success or fledging success is very poor that particular year. And there are also these intervening cases where the weather has been erratic and it is, it is chaos. So there are these subtle changes that is visible. 
Okay, so, <clears throat> but we need a lot more amount of data uh, collection. The citizen science program, which uh, uh, Suhail and others have started off, uh, the eBird uh, program, uh, has uh, helped us to understand some of these patterns, like the timing of arrival, timing of departure, and all of this. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank uh, you again for joining us and sharing such wonderful insights. I'm sure uh, all of us have learned something new today. Um, in case you missed uh, uh, any of uh, any part of uh, uh, Dr. Suresh Kumar's presentation, we'll be uploading it on our YouTube channel. Uh, my colleague Garima has shared the link uh, with everyone in the chat box. If you um, um, want to remain updated about uh, the such future uh, such webinars in the future, uh, please follow us on uh, social media. I have shared our Instagram. Uh, Twitter and Facebook links in the chat box. If you still have some burning questions for uh, Dr. Suresh, um, you yeah, can free write to write to me. me. Yes, free to write to me. Yes, uh, you can write to us at earlybird at ncf-india.org. I have uh, typed that in the chat box. Um, we'll forward the questions uh, to Sir. And yeah, uh, uh, also please write back to us if you have any feedback or comments mm -hmm. or other queries. So thank you everyone again for joining us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Suresh, again. for. No, it was my pleasure. And uh, I see uh, that many of you have patiently sat and listened to this long uh, an hour and a half or more. So thank you very much for listening. And these are good stories. So please do share with your friends and colleagues and pass on the message about uh, these fascinating uh, living forms in, in, in our planet. Thank you. Thank you.